They're interacting with the Higgs field. If that picture's true, then we have to discover those Higgs particles at the LHC. If it's not true, because it's quite a convoluted mechanism, although it's the simplest we've been able to think of, then whatever does the job of the Higgs particles, we know have to turn up at the LHC. So that's one of the prime reasons we've built this giant machine. I, I'm glad you recognize Margaret Thatcher, actually. I thought about making it more culturally relevant. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so, so that's one thing. That, that's essentially a guarantee about what the LHC will find. There are many other things. You, you've heard many of the big problems in particle physics. One of them you heard about dark matter, dark energy. There's another issue, which is that the forces of nature, it's quite beautiful actually, seem, as you go back in time, they seem to change in strength, or they do change in strength. So the electromagnetic force, the force that holds us together, gets stronger as you go to higher temperatures. The strong force, the strong nuclear force, sticks nuclei together, gets weaker. And what you see in the standard model, you can calculate how these change, is the forces, the three forces other than gravity, almost seem to come together at one point. It's almost as if there was one beautiful kind of super force back at the beginning of time. But they just miss. Now, there's a theory called supersymmetry, which doubles the number of particles in the standard model, which at first sight doesn't sound like a simplification. But actually, with this theory, we find that the forces of nature do seem to unify together back at the Big Bang. Absolutely beautiful property. The model wasn't built to do that, but it seems to do it. Also, those supersymmetric particles are very strong candidates for the dark matter. So a very compelling theory. That's really uh, mainstream physics. And if I were to put money on it, I would put money on, in a very unscientific way, that, that these things would also crop up at the LHC. Many other things that the LHC could discover. But in the last few minutes, I just want to give you a, a different perspective it, it's, uh, of what I think what particle physics really means to me, particle physics and cosmology. And that's that I think it's given us a wonderful narrative, almost a creation story, if you'd like, about the universe from, from modern science over the last few decades. And I'd say that it, it deserves, in the spirit of Wade Davis's talk, to be at least put up there with these wonderful creation stories of the, the people, the, the, the high Andes and of the, the frozen north. This is a creation story, I think, equally as wonderful. The story goes like this. We know that the universe began 13.7 billion years ago in an immensely hot, dense state, you know, much smaller than a single atom. It began to expand about a million, billion, 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 billionth of a second. I think I got that right, <laughs> after the Big Bang. Gravity separated away from the other forces. The universe then underwent an exponential expansion called inflation. In about the first billionth of a second or so, the Higgs field kicked in, and the quarks and the gluons and the electrons that make us up got mass. The universe continued to expand and cool. After about a few minutes, there was hydrogen and helium in the universe. That's all. The universe was about 75% hydrogen, 25% helium. It still is today. It continued to expand about 300 million years. Then light began to travel through the universe. It was big enough to be transparent to light. And that's what we see in the cosmic microwave background, the George Smoot described as looking at the face of God. After about 400 million years, the first stars formed. And that hydrogen, that helium, then began to cook into the heavier elements. So the elements of life, carbon and oxygen and iron, all the elements that we need to make us up were cooked in those first generation of stars, which then run out of fuel, exploded through those elements back into the universe. They then recollapsed into another generation of stars and planets. And on some of those planets, the oxygen, which had been created in that first generation of stars, could fuse with hydrogen to form water, liquid water on the surface. On at least one, and maybe only one of those planets, primitive life evolved, which evolved over millions of years into things that walked upright and left footprints about three and a half million years ago in the mudflats of Tanzania, and eventually left a footprint on another world, and built this civilization, this wonderful picture that turned the darkness into night, and you could see the civilization from space. As one of my great heroes, Carl Sagan, said, these are the things and actually, not only these, but I was looking around. These are the things, right? Saturn V rockets and Sputnik and, and DNA and literature and science. These are the things that hydrogen atoms do when given 13.7 billion years. Absolutely <laughs> remarkable. And the laws of physics. 
right? So the right laws of physics, they're beautifully balanced. If the weak force had been a little bit different, then carbon and oxygen wouldn't be stable inside the hearts of stars, and there would be none of that in the universe. And I think that's a, a wonderful and significant story. Fifty years ago, I couldn't have told that story because we didn't know it. It makes me really feel that that civilization, which, as I say, as if you believe the scientific creation story, uh, has emerged purely as a result of the laws of physics and a few hydrogen atoms, then I think, to me anyway, it makes me feel incredibly valuable. So that's the LHC. The LHC is certainly, when it turns on in summer, going to write the next chapter of that book. And I'm certainly looking forward with immense excitement to it being turned on. Thanks.